Hello and a very warm welcome to the channel. So you may remember in the heady days of October 2023 I did a reaction to a wired video which as accent expert gives a tour of US accents, a uh, bit of a tongue twister, which I really enjoyed, was really interesting, but there's a part two which I never got around to doing so no time like the present. Now the first part was mainly about accents on the American East Coast, so we, we did like New York, Philadelphia, Boston, uh, some southern accents as well, I think there was North Carolina, I had to go back and rewatch it <laughs> because I couldn't really remember what was in it. Yeah, I probably should have done this quicker. Um, but yeah, I'm guessing this part two will mainly cover more western accents of kind of California, maybe some midwestern accents as well, It'd be really interesting to see. I do remember from the first video that they said that there's actually more variety in American accents on the eastern coast than on the western coast. I think the, the rationale for that being that English has been spoken there for longer, which it will be really interesting to see to what extent this kind of turns out to be the case from the second video. If you haven't already, please do subscribe and let's go. Hi, Eric Singer Hello. again, dialect coach. I'm doing a map tour of North American accents. If you missed part one, check it out here. I'm starting part well, better two still, check out my reaction video, which is somehow better. <laughs> I don't know how. North American accent map tour part two. Picking up where we left off, we were talking about rhotic accents, where the R sound is always pronounced in the Piney Woods Bill. But down in... So that, that's what I see as like a very so stereotypical Southern American accent, right, with, 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 that, um, with that R sound. Southern part of Louisiana. It is one of the few areas that's still pretty reliably non rhotic Even though many historically non rhotic areas of the South have gotten their R's back, this one's hanging on. This is also one of the places in the South, the Appalachians and the Ozarks, or a few of the others, some parts of Texas, where you still hear a wh sound, words like which, what, where. You also get F for final TH sounds here. Okay. See both, bath. Something I think is really interesting is that there used to be a non rhotic pronunciation of nice words in the South. So words like nice, early, work, used by black and white southerners alike, that was a kind of a diphthong. Oi, nice. So th exactly. this is one thing I hadn't appreciated. Um, so obviously I knew it was a southern accent. I hadn't appreciated the, the degree of regional variation, but like South Louisiana is, is distinct from other areas in the South, I, I guess from North, North Louisiana. I just sort of seen like there's a southern accent and there's like a kind of general American accent. Then there's California Valley Girl uh, and Boston's a bit weird. And then there's Midwestern and like New York. <laughs> and that, that's kind of what I thought there was. Um, so it, it's really interesting hearing the degree of variations within these kind of broader accent groups, particularly in the South, which I just knew nothing about. Also, it, I, I have heard that in Louisiana, there's still a community of people who I don't know if they speak French, but they're like a French origin and they're still quite sort of culturally French. Um, so I, I don't know if that's the case, but I'd be interested if you could clarify in the comments, like are they make good bread or something, or they like have on onions and berries. I'm probably being too stereotypical, but there, there's like a, a, a French community, because obviously it used to be a, a French territory. Actually pretty similar to that old fashioned New York City, Toady Toy Street, Bowser. Ah. You can still hear it in some African-American speakers in Louisiana today. Oh, it's mostly gone otherwise. Before moving on, let's circle back to Florida so Megan okay. can tell us about the Cuban Spanish. Interesting, we're still, Miami. we're still on the eastern Hello coast. Again. This time I'm in Miami. Ooh. The Latinx population in the US is 18.5% of the population. Hmm. But within that, we're a very diverse group of people. Before we get into Miami English, I just want to make it clear that not every speaker of Miami English is Latinx. Not every Latinx person in Miami speaks Miami English. And the same goes for New York Latinx. Oh, I, I, this is just like some, the impression I've got, but I get the impression that a lot of people who kind of immigrated to America from Spanish speaking countries are kind of speaking more and more English. Is, is that the case? Um, and kind of becoming more, more integrated into the dominant culture. But it, it, there's something quite similar in the UK. So there's an accent which is now called London Multicultural English, which is um, I suppose what you call kind of the, the working class, it, 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 it's, it's very ethnically diverse, it's very heavily influenced by, by Caribbean accents and African to some extent. Um, it's very popular with kind of areas of London that once would have been Cockney, and Cockney has been pushed kind of further out into Essex and Kent. So it's kind of interesting how like new groups arrive, you know, like bring um, the, the interaction of their languages and kind of local languages, these new accents. 
Filipino English. Interesting. And the same will go for Chicano English in the Southwest when we get there. We are not a monolith, and neither are the varieties that we speak. And that's because these varieties are influenced by different Spanishes. Mm, so just okay. like the English-speaking world has different varieties, so does the Spanish-speaking world. Yeah. There's so many different varieties of Spanish. There's Mexican Spanish, there's Cuban Spanish, there's Puerto Rican Spanish, there's Dominican Spanish, there's all these other Spanishes. Okay, here's a question. Um, if any Spanish speakers, like, are the differences greater or lesser than between English speakers? So, like, but, like is the difference between Mexican Spanish and Colombian Spanish bigger than the difference between British, Australian and American English, for example? I'd be genuinely really interested to know, um, because, like, I, I feel we're pretty mutually intelligible. Like, that, you know, there's a few words and a few phrases that, that trip you up, but generally, I don't think there's any big problems. But, yeah, it'd be interesting. There are all these varieties, and they all have different features, and we just don't have time to get into that. Miami English is influenced by Cuban Spanish. Like, take a look at this map. Cuba is very close to Miami. Mm. One remarkable feature... I, just, that bit, I didn't quite realise there's a great big, big bit of Florida which goes down like halfway into the ocean. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I, I know that obviously like Florida's had a lot of um, human immigrants, particularly after the revolution, I think, so yeah, that makes English sense. Is the dark L. If you recall from New York, Revolution the dark L in Cuba is, is in words not, like not America. And ball in Miami English, you'll hear that dark L in places where you wouldn't hear it in other varieties. Listen to the L in this native speaker clip. That's what I love about our language, 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 yeah. and about yeah. Okay, it's back quite to Eric. Distinct. Thank you, Megan. Okay, back to Louisiana. So back there's a Louisiana. well known New Orleans accent that sounds similar to New York accents in some ways. It's called yet, which comes from the phrase where yet, which means how are you? It's so similar to New York accents in some ways, it's a bit of a mystery. Even some really <laughs> weird little things like bed and back not having the same vowel sound. I got a bad... It's very, like, pleasing on the ears. It's very relaxing. I, I, I could listen to someone... Like, you could read the phone book to me in that accent, and I, I would um, I, I'd remain calm whilst, like, explosions went off around me and, and the world could continue to disintegrate. Um, yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. I, I can definitely see what he means. It does sound. It sounds like a, kind of like a New York Southern hybrid. I'd say. Back. New Orleans had a similar mix of immigration to New York in the nineteenth century, mm -hmm. but also very close shipping ties to New York City. So okay. contact is likely part of the explanation too. Of course, we can't leave Louisiana without talking about Cajun. The Cajuns were a French-speaking people. Oh, yeah. came down to Louisiana from Nova Scotia. This might be answering my question, <laughs> in which case I feel a bit stupid answering. At least you know these questions, like, these views are genuine, because I wouldn't um, boast about my knowledge about something he's literally about to tell us about, and they look like a fool. Now, some still speak Cajun French, but you can hear the influence French had on Cajun so, accents in English, so some do speak the rhythm French. and the melody. The way there's a tendency to stress the final word or syllable. I just want French. to go to, to Louis Louisiana and use my school. I, I, I spent like two, three years learning French in school and I remember almost nothing. Um, but I want to go to Louisiana and see how I get on. Bonjour. Um, où est la station metro, s'il vous plaît? See? In Louisiana, I'll be, I'll be on fire. And also in the way final consonant sounds can get assimilated, sort of slooped up into the sound before them. So that ham could just be ham, rent could just be rent. Mm. Hand me the rent there. So continuing wow, that's west of Texas. Really abbreviated. Now, one thing that sets a lot of Texans apart from other Southerners is that there's a lot less goose front. So the tongue stays further back through that whole vowel sound instead of coming forwards. So if I go from, say, somewhere in the Carolinas and head west and talk about blue moons and soup spoons. I'll start off with very fronted goose vowels, blue moons and soup spoons, but they'll get... I'm a little bit confused by this blue moon and soup spoons business, I'm not going to lie. Less and less fronted the further west I go. Blue moons and soup spoons, blue moons and soup spoons. When I cross the Mississippi, I don't have very fronted goose vowels anymore, but by the time I'm in Texas, blue moons and soup spoons, it's not coming forward hardly at all now. Now, one thing that I, I, yeah, I, the I eastern get it. part of the state from the western part is how far the price smoothing goes. Remember when we talked about how piney woods belled accents have full-on price smoothing, so it affects ride and right, live and life? 
we'll see that kind of full-on version in western and central Texas. Yeah. All those words are smoothed out just like that. But in the eastern part, it's only on words like high, ride, and live. Words like right and life will have a diphthong. Why is it this way? Well, again, because of the history of settlement patterns. The white people who settled in the western part, in the Great Plains part of Texas, the western and central parts, mostly came from Tennessee and the Appalachians. Full price smooth. Well, it's really interesting how you can like trace back um, kind of the differences between accents, even within one state, to kind of different settlement patterns and different events in history. Um, the, the extent to which that still leaves like a really visible mark, and it, well, in this case, an audio mark, is um, it's kind of quite impressive. No, it's interesting. As we head up into Oklahoma, I'm going to turn it over to Kalina Newmark again. Hello again! Oklahoma is the home to nearly 40 Native American nations, including the Cherokee and the Comanche. Before jumping into the local Native American dialect features here in Oklahoma, I'm going to share a little bit about the history of Native American English. Sure. Native American English is also known as a res accent, a reservation accent. It occurs in First Nations and Native American communities across the United States and Canada, regardless of whether or not a heritage language is spoken. Plus, it's really interesting that there's like a, a sort of co common Native American accent, um, rather than like every tribe having its own kind of distinct accent, perhaps mixed in with its native language. It's kind of interesting that, 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 that they've kind of like accumulated that, but, but, but at the same time it's remained distinct by, by the sound of things from kind of the various other American accents. Native American English is often identifiable because of its prosody. Sometimes it's described- I don't know what that word means, I feel stupid. It's monotone. Other times it's described as sing-songy. Within okay, Oklahoma, that helps. community members describe Native American English both ways. And that makes sense. There are different varieties within the state. In Western Oklahoma, the Anadarko accent has been described as monotone. Okay. Contrast that with Cherokee English in Eastern Oklahoma, which is more- Okay, um, ignore what I said a minute ago. Apparently there are actually quite substantial variations between tribes, which is kind of what I would have expected, so that makes sense. Sing songy. Sometimes we forget where we come from, you know what? With that, let's go back to Eric on the map tour. Thank you, Kalina. Quick stop in the Ozarks, where we can hear some accents that are real close to Southern Appalachian accents. A little bit different goat vowel and some others, but real close in a lot of ways. Which is because, again, of settlement patterns. Mm -hmm. The original European settlers of the Ozarks came from Southern Appalachia. And we hear some of those same constructions, like a going and a hunting, as well as a lot of shared specific dialect words. Now, up in Chicago, and in fact in the whole Great Lakes area, we have one of the most significant ongoing changes happening anywhere in the English-speaking world today. Okay. It's called the Northern Cities Shift, or the Northern Cities Vowel Shift. And it may be the biggest change in English pronunciation anywhere since the Great Vowel Shift, right up to and through Shakespeare's time. Now, it's a change shift, which is kind of a... So I, I know there's a theory that um, these old... If you go back like 300 years, people in Britain may have spoken more like contemporary Americans than like contemporary Brits. And that kind of, well, especially my accent is actually quite a, a recent innovation. Um, it kind of became fashionable around, around London and then spread out to other bits of the country. But the, King George III probably spoke more like a, like a, a, a contemporary person from North Carolina than, than me. I, I, again, I don't think we know that for certain, but I've read a theory and it's, it's kind of interesting, so before I share it. Very go around of changes. Here's how it goes. So in most accents of English, the vowel sound in words like uh, cat, bag, what we call the trap vowel, is something like ah, mm. right? We make it with the tongue cupped down low and towards the front of the mouth like this. Ah, okay, ah. ready for this? Here's the first move in the northern city's chain shift. This vowel unit moves up in this direction. So it's pronounced with a little bit tenser tongue and sounds like cat, bag, up here. Put the cat in the bag. Now that leaves an open space in terms of available vowel real estate where that trap vowel used to be. Now it turns out that vowel sounds like to space themselves out in our mouths. They abhor a vowel vacuum, if you will. <laughs> and so Good what happens is that the lot vowel, which, you know, normally lives back here, your tongue cupping low down in the back. I hadn't thought this much about how, like, which different parts of your, your mouth use. Um, 
I mean, honestly, like it's, it's almost too much information. It's, it's like seeing what's in the sausage. <laughs> now, now I'm thinking every time I speak about where my tongue is, and it's slightly disconcerting me. But it is interesting. Ah, sound moves forwards towards where trap used to be. So in Chicago, it's not a hot pot, it's a hat pot. Hat now those pot. are just the first two mm -hmm. moves in the chain shift. The thing about a chain shift is each move makes the next one happen. So, so like give it a couple of generations and people in Chicago are speaking their own language, <laughs> which would be like, it's really, it's interesting that this, this is still happening. Um, Cause like one of the things people talk about in the, I mean, the UK has a ridiculous number of accents, I guess, because it's so old. Um, and I mean, like, like in America, they're kind of, some of the links are kind of historic events and migration patterns and things. Um, but there is a theory that the, it's, some of the regional accents are starting to die out a little bit. And I think there's, I think there's some truth to that with some of them, I guess, because of kind of greater homogeneity, social media, etc, etc. Um, so I'd be interested if you guys think that's happening in America. Are, are, are Americans sounding more the same than before or, or very much not? I mean, it, in the UK, it's so, some of them started so far apart. I mean, to the extent that like someone from Manchester and someone from Liverpool sound like they're from different planets. Um, and, they, and they wish they were from different planets, believe me. They, those two cities do not like being next to each other. Um, but yeah, but they, 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 because it sounded so, started from so far apart, it's perhaps less of a big deal but i don't know i'd be interested to hear what you guys say about whether americans are sounding more similar or, or indeed dissimilar trap moving up higher pushes the dress vowel back in the mouth so words like bed next sound like but next mm. and then the vowel sound that was back there to begin with the uh so if i go to chicago i got to ask for a bud Okay, I better remember this. Sound in strut, bus, Bud lucky, and has to move back further. Bus, lucky. So now, cot sounds like cat, bat sounds like bet, bet sounds like butt, and butt sounds like bot. Pretty dramatic shift. Okay. At this whole area. I'm not going to Chicago, it's going to be a disaster. I'll accidentally order a bat. And it'll be really socially embarrassing, and I'll release a new, I'll, I'll release a new pandemic because that came from about right. Yeah, no, I'm I'm avoiding Chicago now. Around the Great Lakes is affected by the northern city's shift, though not every part of it has it to the same extent. Besides Chicago, it's strongest in uh, Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, and Detroit. Let's head over to St. Louis. Here's Nicole. There's a feature in African American English in places like St. Louis and Memphis called the Near Square Nurse Merger or our centralization. If you know the song by the rapper Nelly, Hot and Her, you have seen an example of this. It is her or here or our centralization. Okay. And you can also hear it in this clip. Girl, I told you I need to get my her done, her done, her done. Okay, let's go back to Eric. Thank you, Nicole. Again, it's, it's interesting that like, because for all these different areas, you hear kind of like the standard, I suppose what they mean by standard is what is kind of white American accent from that area. And then you've got like a, a slightly different African American accent, or in some take cases, quite different. And then obviously, like there's also like Latino and native accent. It's, it's really interesting how, how many different factors, like, you know, race, ethnicity, social class, geography, like migration patterns kind of played into the contemporary accents of America that we all know and love. Can we talk about Minnesota for a minute? Absolutely you know, not. People from Minnesota often complain about overbroad, stereotypical Minnesota accents, just going too far. Two really identifiable features of that are monophthongal A and O in your face and goat vowels. But you know, okay. there are definitely places in Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, and yep, Fargo, North Dakota, where you can still hear some pretty pronounced accents with some really monophthongal A and O vowels. Now, but even in much less pronounced accents. Okay, so this, this brings me to another question. Um, I can never tell the difference between Americans and Canadians. I mean, obviously I can, I can tell the difference between a Canadian and someone from Texas, but I won't know if that, that Canadian is Canadian or if they're just from like one of the Northern states. Is that something you guys can tell straight away? Because I, I know that Americans often get like British and Australian and New Zealand accents mixed up. Um, and to us, like particularly British and Australian sound very distinct. Aus New Zealand is almost sort of in between. Um, but I'd be interested to know whether you guys can like, I, 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 I'm not, not, not in like a xenophobic way, like there's a Canadian, let's get him. Um, but like, can you tell if someone's from Canada just by their accent? Or is it 
the same as it is for me and you just sort of don't really know you, you just know they're somewhere in um the, the northern part of north america from this region there will still be a bit of that you'll also still get this fairly closed oral posture so there's a contrast between lips that are pretty mobile and move around a lot and a jaw that stays pretty fixed in place mm. now let's stop over in the dakotas and i'll hand it off i might just adapt my accent on the basis of which is the laziest like as he was talking about one way you don't move your mouth much or you, you, you keep your tongue still think how many extra calories a day i could save <laughs> if, if i adopted that accent i mean i get weird looks um in london but whatever i, I can do or conversely perhaps i should go for the most expressive one that i can burn more calories and i can eat more junk food it's given me a lot to think about hi again from the traditional homelands of the lakota dakota and nakota people Continuing and I, th th these are the these are the Lakota are the same as the Sioux, I think, right? And they're the ones like the little little big horn and Custer, all that stuff. Our conversation, a Native American English. I'm going to talk about two shared features: one, timing and rhythm, and two, intonation and pitch. In regards to timing and rhythm, Native American English is syllable timed, where syllables are more uniform and even in length. You can hear that feature in this clip. You see a piece of trash, you pick it up. For the second mm. feature, intonation and pitch, the stress syllable starts lower rather than higher. I would watch them. In this clip from the movie Smoke Signals, this actor is speaking in a Native American English accent. You can hear that on Thomas here. Hey, Thomas. There are several theories of where this dialect came from. One theory is that it developed because of Native American boarding schools. Established in the okay. late 19th and mid 20th century, Native American boarding schools were designed to assimilate Native American children into white society. They did this by forcibly removing Native American children from their families and communities and forbidding them from speaking their languages. At the time of European contact yeah. in North America, there were approximately 300 distinct indigenous languages. Since then, 113 of these languages have been lost and many more are in danger as fewer and fewer Native American children are learning our languages. Despite all of this, we so it, Yeah, no, it, 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 it sounds like there are still a lot of Native American languages going. Um, like, like, do you ever get it like, I don't know, like if, if you're in like a supermarket, um, do, you, do you ever hear like Lakota or kind of other Native languages that kind of interested? Or, or is that more like in sort of just in certain communities? We did a dialect of English that is uniquely ours a dialect that helps us to create and recreate our identities as Native American people. Nice. Let's go back to Eric for the next stop on the map tour. Thank Come you. on, Eric. Quick detour to Iowa. So remember that on line that runs through New Jersey, where above it, most people say on rhymes with Don, and south of it, most people say on rhymes with Don. And it runs right along a really major dialect boundary between mm. the north, linguistically speaking, and the Midlands. And it runs through all of these states and through Iowa, too. Now, people don't necessarily think of Iowa having a lot of dialect variety, but here's a major division right here. So Sioux City and Cedar Rapids are above the on line, so most people in those places say on. And Des Moines is below it, so most people there will say on. All right, so heading west now, over towards the Rockies, you know, one of the things we start to hear in the Mountain West generally is ing endings pronounced as in, so playing, going, singing, the whole western part of the country. So these 11 states is usually considered one big dialect area. Now, okay. That's not to say that there aren't any... So this goes back, I guess, to his earlier point about there being more variety on the east coast than the west coast, uh, which is something I hadn't totally clocked. I mean, like, I say the very... Dis I know, like, the sort of California Valley girl accent, which is very distinct. Distinct enough that even I could pick it up before watching any of these videos. Um, but I, I kind of assumed there was going to be more on the West Coast, but I guess perhaps not. Differences, of course there are, but broadly speaking, it's one area with a lot of common features. There just hasn't been enough time for really distinctive features to develop over yeah. here. Here's something interesting in some Utah accents, though. Some front vowels get lowered before L sounds. So we get milk, for instance. The word sale might sound like cell. Mm. Is this milk on cell? You'll also hear mountain and button, mountain and button Man, a lot in Utah, yeah. especially among younger speakers with just a pure glottal stop uh, for that T sound in the middle of the word. Okay. It's not the only place in the U.S. that does that, not at all. 
but apart from some California speakers, it seems to be the only place in the West where you hear those pronunciations. That is We're gonna really have... interesting. I've also just, I think it's better. End it's... this segment here. Yeah. Okay, so I've also just noticed as a part three. So in five months' time, um, give or take, I will do part three. And like, I'm guessing that's a final part, right? They can't, they can't, it, it, otherwise it just goes on forever. Like part twelve of um, the accent tour, but no, I, I, I've, it's been, I've really enjoyed it. I found it very interesting. My two main takeaways, first of all, is the greater variety in the east from the west, which was just, I just had no idea about. Um, I, I, I mean, it could kind of makes sense the, the way he says it. The second is there are definitely more accents than I expected, particularly in the east, uh, and I'm still honestly, I don't think I could tell the difference between someone from like. South Louisiana and North Louisiana, because that, that was why and him saying there was something quite distinctive. I mean, I, I just wouldn't pick it up. Um, but there, there's definitely more than I expected. Because I say, like, coming from the UK, which there's just crazy numbers of accents. I mean, like, in, in, in the UK, there were, there were, you, you hear accents, but like, I struggled to understand them. <laughs> and I've lived here my whole life. So, um, yeah, I, I, I feel... I, Tourists have my like, the vast majority of people you find with it's just a very occasion you get some really strong local accent from an area you're not familiar with. But yeah, um, tourists, if you if you can get past that, you have my utmost respect. But it's it's interesting that America did have more than I thought, so that's um, a little bit of a surprise. But yeah, no, I hope you enjoyed. If you haven't already, please do subscribe. It really helps the channel. And I hope to see you on the next video, and then I hope to see you in five, six months' time for, for part three, <laughs> which, I, which I guess will probably cover, like, California. Um, and by the look of things, Canada, judging by the fact they've got a bunch of Canadian stuff on it. So, yeah, let's go.